I wasn't actually planning on making another one of these videos for a while, but I keep getting suggestions for far right content on YouTube after all my time looking up right wingers' terrible Star Wars takes, and Dennis Prego is like a herpes infested boomerang. No matter how many times you try to get rid of him, he always comes back. Today we're talking about immigration, always an uncontroversial topic, and one on which I'm sure far right purveyor of disgusting rhetoric and propaganda, Prego U, will have an empathetic, nuanced take on. Ha ha ha. Oh god, I want to kill myself. Now here's a question you may be thinking about. Surely, even Dennis Prager, everyone's racist grandfather, has the self-awareness to recognise that maybe an elderly white man complaining about immigrants on the internet may not be great optics. Well, no worries there, Dennis has in fact thought of this, and so decided to hire a bunch of other people, some of whom are, shock horror, not white, to repeat his poisonous rhetoric instead. Now, cards on the table, I'm not exactly neutral on the subject of immigration. In fact, I am all for the complete and total abolition of borders, so if you are expecting a milk toast and or unbiased response here, I'm afraid you'll be waiting in vain. I made a whole video about how I feel about borders, and an almost feature length separate one about, among other things, just how fucked up US immigration and detention policies are right now, so feel free to check those out for more context. But to reiterate here, I think that any and all borders are made up and arbitrary. Enforcing them is an unnecessary and inhumane example of the violence that the state enjoys exercising over non-white people. So which videos are we going to be discussing? Pregu has, of course, made a ton of videos about immigration because they're racist, xenophobic bigots, and immigration and culture are excellent dog whistles to hide bigotry behind nowadays, if that infamous Nick Griffin clip is anything to go by. Perhaps one day, once by being rather more subtle, we got ourselves in a position where we control the British broadcasting media, then perhaps one day the British people might change their mind and say, yes, every last one must go. Perhaps they will one day. But if you hold that out as your sole aim to start with, you're going to get absolutely nowhere. So, instead of talking about racial purity, you talk about identity. Seriously though, am I going to imply that PragerU are nothing more than crypto-fascist peddlers of hatred without explaining or elaborating on such an accusation? Well, today, we'll be discussing the following videos. The Suicide of Europe, which, as I'm sure you can work out just from the title, is Great Replacement Bullshit. A Nation of Immigrants, which is basically just lies about how apparently generous and lenient the USA is when it comes to immigration despite all the evidence to the contrary, which was already offensively untrue at the time and, um, hasn't aged well, shall we say. Illegal Immigration, It's About Power, in which infamous bigot and discount Bill O'Reilly, Tucker Carlson, explains why leftists might support open borders policies, and concludes that it is not because of empathy or solidarity or anything like that, but is in fact a method of gaining votes. Immigrants don't vote for what you fled, which attempts to frame refugees as actually only fleeing from big government and not, you know, the truth. And then finally, we have the reason that I actually decided to make this video, their most recent video on the subject, A Fine Time to Become an American, in which a recent British immigrant to the USA sings the praises of the American immigration system, and you'll see why I decided to discuss it when it comes up. Nothing by Dennis himself this time around, I'm afraid, but I'm sure this isn't the last we've seen him in this series. Anyway, without further ado, let's jump in. <laughs> The civilization born of Judeo-Christian values, ancient Greek philosophy, and the discoveries of the Enlightenment is staring at the abyss brought there by its own hand. To put it starkly, Europe is committing suicide. Right, great start there. First off, what does Judeo-Christian mean? I mean, you and I both know that it means white, but let's just examine it for a moment. Does Judeo-Christian values include social norms in much of Africa and Asia? Does it include the values of Israel? Now, to be fair here, the term Judeo-Christian was originally created in the US post-war in an attempt to fight anti-Semitism in America at the time and show that Christians and Jews had very similar values. Although as more and more Muslims have entered and integrated into American society, it's become more and more clear that it's an outdated term, and many historians and theologians prefer the term Abrahamic as both a more politically and racially neutral and more accurate term, which also includes Islam. By the 1970s, the phrase was basically used as a way of uniting Catholics, Mormons, Protestants and Jews into a religious right-wing voting bloc. And throughout most of the last few decades, it's been used as a shield to hide behind while promoting far-right views and policies against, for example, abortion and gay marriage. Nowadays, of course, it's mostly just a way for conservatives to 
exclude Muslims from the conversation. Ancient Greek philosophy is a huge area, but just to make it clear, a lot of ancient Greek society saw pederasty as an acceptable or even morally superior act, and of course categorically did not hold Judeo-Christian values. I'm not going to go into the Enlightenment much, but just going to point out that the French Revolution, widely accepted to have happened as a result of the Enlightenment and the ideas it brought about, such as the consent of the governed, was an example of the people taking over and overthrowing their masters, which as staunch capitalists and imperialists, PragerU probably hates as ideas. How did this happen? It's a complicated story, but there are two major causes. The first is the mass movement of peoples into Europe. Yep, yeah, this is this is white nationalist propaganda. Let's see where it goes, shall we? Okay, so how does immigration kill Europe. As is later pointed out, this has been going on for decades, and I would even argue centuries, and Europe's not dead yet, but we'll come back to this point soon. Whenever I get one of these PragerU videos, I always take the time to Google the speakers, assuming it's not just Dennis again, and I'm going to share my findings on these fine people with you on each one. Douglas Murray is a political pundit and author who has written books such as, and prepare yourself for this, Neoconservatism, Why We Need It, Islamophilia, A Very Metropolitan Malady, The Madness of Crowds, Gender, Identity, Morality, and of course the subject of this video, The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity, Islam. He once described far-right dictator Viktor Orban as a better sentinel of European values than George Soros. Paraphrased. In 2006, he said, concerning Muslims integrating into Britain, conditions for Muslims in Europe must be made harder across the board. Europe must look less like an attractive proposition. From long before we were first attacked, it should have been made plain that people who come into Europe are here under our rules, not theirs. If some Muslims don't have a mosque to go to, then they'll just have to realise that they aren't owed one. He was given an opportunity to retract the statement by Conservative MP, but refused. Interestingly, he's an atheist, but has described himself as a cultural Christian and a Christian atheist so as not to alienate his conservative supporters. He is an openly gay man, which makes him yet another in the long list of marginalised people who the far right can use as a weapon to beat other marginalised people, along with Dave Rubin and Ben Shapiro. As a disabled pansexual myself, I find it astonishing that people who must have gone through the struggles that our identities push upon us, rather than using that to find common ground and build empathy with others, instead take the side of their own oppressors in order to keep others down. My experiences growing up and living in society with my identity has only led me to have more empathy empathy for those in similar positions, not less. But I suppose that my experience is not universal by any stretch. Oh, and he also said that the EDL, a far-right group of violent thugs led by Tommy Robinson, had a point. So he sounds just like the kind of guy you want to get a beer with, unless you're not white, I mean. This has been going on steadily since the end of World War II, but sped up massively in the migration crisis of 2015 when more than a million migrants poured into Europe from the Middle East, North Africa and East Asia. What do people from these regions have in common that migration from places like Romania, which was the subject of a lot of immigration hysteria a few years back when it joined the EU, do not? I wonder. The second, and equally significant, is that Europe lost faith in itself, its beliefs, its traditions, and even its very legitimacy. What are these beliefs and traditions, and why does non-white people entering the continent somehow jeopardise or lessen these beliefs and traditions? Also, the problem with this Great Replacement shit is that it assumes that Europe is fundamentally homogenous, which is frankly just horrendously misinformed, considering the vast differences between, for example, the UK and Italy, or Ireland and Portugal, or Greece and Denmark. All these countries have vast arrays of beliefs and traditions. Turkey, for example, has a majority Muslim population. Italy, as a heavily Catholic country, celebrates different things from the UK, a majority of the population of which is ostensibly under the Church of England, but is pretty much secular at this point. Europeans have vastly different traditions. From the Swedish Midsommar? Midsommar? Yes, I know there's a movie about it, and now I'm not going to watch it unless it has at least a cameo from Inspector Barnaby, to the Spanish running of the bulls, from the Danish belief in the concept of co-housing, to the British belief in the inherent superiority of Britain and need to be independent and sovereign. Let's take a closer look at both causes. For decades, Europe encouraged people, mostly from the Middle East and North Africa, to come as temporary workers. Nobody expected them to stay, Yet they did. And nobody asked them to leave, even those who came illegally. Right, so here we are, temporary workers. 
First off, if someone's been in the country for long enough and they've integrated successfully, they should absolutely be allowed to stay. But also, in most countries, they're allowed to apply for citizenship. This makes sense though, right? Take a look at the fucking disaster that was the Windrush scandal in the UK. We invited people over from the Commonwealth to help us rebuild and repopulate after the war decimated the country, and now, now we've bounced back, and those people, some of whom had been in the UK for 50 years, lived almost their whole lives here, started families, had kids and grandkids, etc. They were basically told to go fuck themselves and deported back to countries they hadn't seen in decades to await the results of appealing against Theresa May's infamous hostile environment deport first, appeal later policy. Of course, PragerU conveniently leaves this out because, well, you know, including a section that explains that actually they were asked to leave and it caused huge public outcry and will forever stain Theresa May's legacy as Margaret Thatcher's last Horcrux might go against their point a little bit here. As one British immigration minister put it in 1999, removal takes too long and it's emotional. Baba Roche is a favourite punching bag and scapegoat of the alt-right. She's a big fan of immigration and I actually agree with her on a lot of what she has to say. In fact, she has a whole 15 minute talk about her stance on it and the history of immigration in Britain, making the point that we are a nation of immigrants, from the Romans to the Vikings to the Normans and so on. I do take issue with the fact that she mostly uses examples of invasions, considering a lot of far-right rhetoric revolves around that, but the core of what she says is reasonable enough and, to be honest, most of the criticism of her policies can be more accurate applied to Tony Blair, considering that he was, you know, the Prime Minister at the time. It's very interesting that if you google this quote, you mostly get reactionary and literal neo-Nazi articles about the Great Replacement, with headlines such as, Traitor in Downing Street, the traitor within, how the Jewess Barbara Roche and the communist Tony Blair screwed the whites and turned Britain non-white, and was mass immigration a conspiracy? From publications with recommended links like this, and logos like this. Yikes. And, of course, why would they leave? The economic opportunities were far greater in Europe than from where they came, and if the work dried up, there were generous welfare benefits to be had. And why might the economic opportunities be better in Europe than Africa? I can't possibly imagine. Okay, two things. One, every country in the EU can refuse to pay benefits to migrants coming in, should it so choose, and two, it is now common knowledge that immigrants contribute far more to the economy through taxes than they take out via benefits. For a time, immigrants were allowed, even encouraged thanks to the European commitment to multiculturalism, to pursue whatever culture they wanted. But that didn't work out well. Here's a big question for you. What is culture? What would one define as British culture or Norwegian culture? And how does one person pursue a different culture? Is it tied to religion? Well, it can't be that, because a huge amount of people are non-religious, including the speaker here. So, what is it? Traditions? Again, tradition varies wildly depending on regions and areas. Certain cities might have little variance in traditions. Are you going to stop me having a traditional pork pie during my Christmas dinner? I don't fucking think so, mate. But jokes aside, this is an interesting discussion. Would we declare Scottish people celebrating St Andrew's Day rather than St George's an unacceptable culture celebrated by people who refuse to integrate? And if not, why not? The leaders of Britain, France and Germany admitted as much in 2011 when David Cameron, Nicolas Sarkozy and Angela Merkel dramatically announced that multiculturalism had failed. Yes, they did, because they believed that people being allowed to have religious and cultural freedom might lead to further terror attacks and radicalisation. You know, as opposed to a systematic campaign of harassment and marginalisation, leading to young Muslims being pushed towards more and more extreme ideology because the hate preachers are more able to use rhetoric like the West hates us, victimises us and treats us like subhumans, it's time to fight back. In the UK, some young men find it hard to identify with the traditional Islam practised at home by their parents whose customs can seem stayed when, when transplanted to modern Western countries. But these young men also find it hard to identify with Britain too, because we've allowed the weakening of our collective identity. Under the doctrine of state multiculturalism, we've encouraged different cultures to live separate lives apart from each other and apart from the mainstream. We fail to provide a vision of society to which they feel they want to belong. So, the immigrants were then asked to assimilate and embrace Western values. If that happened, European governments reasoned, all the financial costs, even the occasional acts of terrorism, could be overlooked. But it never happened. 
What are Western values? How can someone assimilate and accept Western values if the term Western values is so fucking worthless that it doesn't even mean anything? So far, all we've got is Judeo-Christian Greek philosophy and the Enlightenment, which to be honest doesn't even describe most Europeans, never mind immigrants. And immigration just increased. During 2015, Germany and Sweden added 2% to their populations in a single year. Why is this a bad thing? By 2017, the most popular boy's name in the United Kingdom was Mohammed. Okay, this is a well-known tactic of far-right publications in the UK. This thing about the names is true if you count all of the various spellings and variations of the name Mohammed and ignore all the cultural context that might explain it. You see, in a lot of cultures, Calling your child Muhammad is a way of giving a blessing to the child, and also in a lot of cultures the middle name is used as the given name, with the first name belonging to God, which is a tradition most non-Muslims do not share. So yes, this is true, but only if you cheat and combine multiple names into one, and also ignore all the relevant context. So, why did European leaders decide Europe could take in anyone in the world, whether fleeing war or simply seeking a better life, no matter how different or even opposed their values were to European values? Well, first of all, it's a legal requirement to accept refugees and asylum seekers, but also the main reason was capitalism. The powers that be wanted a cheap labour force, and after the war, our population, and therefore able-bodied workforce, was severely depleted, even with women being able to work. The one word answer to this question is guilt. Aren't these refugees, the thinking goes, fleeing the consequences of European imperialism? Didn't we mercilessly exploit these unfortunate people in their home countries? Aren't we the cause of their misery? Accepting them into Europe is meant to be a wiping away of this guilt. I mean, yes, that is true. We did cause a lot of the problems plaguing Africa and the Middle East, but there is very little that can be done to wipe away the guilt of imperialism those atrocities still happened. I'm not going to give an estimate, but billions of people's blood is on the hands of imperial nations, both in the past and the present as the legacy of imperialism continues to ravage the continent. Additionally, as I just mentioned, we don't have a choice. Accepting refugees is a legal and moral requirement. This is especially true of Germany. In allowing one and a half million people into her country in 2015, Angela Merkel was, in effect, proclaiming to the world that Germany, the great aggressor of the 20th century, the architect of the Holocaust, would be the humanitarian superpower of the 21st. This is far too much narrativizing of the situation. As Merkel herself put it, she did what she did because she believed it was the right thing to do from a humanitarian point of view, and also to alleviate the pressure on Greece and Italy, who, due to being the two European nations closest to Syria, had taken on the vast majority of refugees. He does not mention Greece, of course, because that might hurt his argument. A noble sentiment, perhaps, but who pays the price? The ordinary citizens of Europe, who've seen crime and terrorism increase exponentially, their fears and frustrations have been largely ignored, or worse. This is not true. Migrant crime is a favourite talking point of the alt-right, and Trump has even tried to use it, but it's not the case. Asylum seekers are not more likely to commit crimes than native-born Germans, unless you want to cherry-pick statistics, like Trump did, by claiming that a very slight bump in crimes in 2015 is indicative of a trend, when since that time, crime numbers have only been decreasing. As with everywhere else, a majority of terror attacks are not carried out by refugees or migrants. That is an absolute lie. In October 2015, the German government designated that 800 newly arrived immigrants were to be housed in the German town of Kassel. This is all well and good to complain about, but Kassel is a town of almost 200,000 citizens, so forgive me, but 800 desperate refugees just looking for a home is not going to cause a huge deal of trouble, in my opinion. Concerned residents had a meeting to ask questions of their representatives. As a video recording shows that his citizens were calm and polite, and then, at a certain point, their district president informs them that the refugees are coming regardless of their objections, and anyone who does not agree with the policy is free to leave Germany. I mean, good? They have to go somewhere, and why should this place be given special treatment just because they're scared of brown people? Something similar happened in my hometown, where a homeless hostel was due to be open nearby, and it caused uproar, which I never understood. They have to be built somewhere, but regardless, there are really only two possibilities. Either it would be bad for the town, in which case why should anyone else have to deal with it just because you don't want to, and feel like being a selfish shithead who doesn't want it near you, or it would be good for the town, in which case fuck you. I don't want to pay for Trident or the armed forces through my taxes, and I don't get a choice with that either, even if I'm polite when I write to my MP about it. 
This official attitude, if there is a problem, it's not with the refugees but with the citizens, reflects a sense of what I call tiredness. A feeling among the elite class that the European story has played out. Who are the elite classes? Do you mean capitalists? Who thinks like this? Who cares about this? What does it mean? That we've tried religion and all imaginable forms of politics, and that each has one after another led us to disaster. We haven't tried socialism, communism, or anarchism. Maybe we should give them a go. We taint every idea we touch, so who's to say that the world wouldn't be better off without us? Europe isn't going anywhere. It's just accepting some non-white people into its countries. It's not dying just because there are a couple of black people here now. Of course, only people who have no idea how lucky they are could take this view. Okay, so first of all, no one does take this view, but even if they did, surely it's more likely that people who are aware of the horrors that Europe has wrought across the globe would be motivated by a drive to improve those regions by, for example, paying reparations, helping former colonies rebuild their civilizations, and so on. Not by doing the bare fucking minimum and allowing refugees into their countries. Surely we must recognize that we are lucky because of the atrocities carried out by our ancestors, and as a result, we want to help balance out that luck. Ironically, no one knows this better than those refugees who truly did assimilate and who defend Western values. Extraordinary people like Somali-born Ayan Hersiali, who left the Netherlands because she believed in the principles of the Enlightenment more than the Dutch did. By believed in the principles of the Enlightenment more than the Dutch did, what he actually means is was designated an anti-Muslim extremist by the Southern Poverty Law Centre after she spent years railing against Islam, and by left because of her beliefs, he actually meant she admitted to lying about her immigration information. Which I don't think is a big deal, but PragerU obviously does. Or Hamid Abdul Samid in Germany, whose life is threatened by fellow immigrants because he defends European values. Hamed Abdel Samad is also viciously anti-Islam. He even wrote a book called Islamic Fascism, but the people who want him dead are not necessarily fellow immigrants, though I'm sure it's possible, but actually the result of a fatwa issued by various clerics in Egypt. So we've basically just established here that European values means hating Muslims. At least we've cleared that one up, I guess. This is the stuff of suicide. The self-annihilation of a culture. It is possible that ordinary Europeans will join their leaders in this pact, but recent opinion polls suggest that they have no intention of doing so. How they act on that intention will be the great story of the years ahead. Are we about to witness the end of Europe, or its rebirth? What the fuck is he suggesting? A far-right coup? Sounds very fashy, not gonna lie. I'm Douglas Murray, author of The Strange Death of Europe, for Prager University. Christ, that was awful. On to the next one. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. These poetic lines, engraved on a bronze plaque beneath the Statue of Liberty, speak to who we are, a nation of immigrants, until now. As Senate Democrat Chuck Schumer lamented, Tears are running down the cheeks of the Statue of Liberty. We've turned our backs on those huddled masses, closed our borders, separated families, hardened our hearts. Yes, this is all correct. Also, before we move on, let's discuss our host for this episode, Michelle Malkin. So, who is Michelle Malkin? Well, she's a regular contributor to Fox News, but more interesting is her literary contributions. She's probably a relatively reasonable person though, right? I mean, she seems pretty calm and collected here. Some of the titles of her books are as follows. Invasion, How America Still Welcomes Terrorists, Criminals, and Other Foreign Menaces. In Defense of Internment, The Case for Racial Profiling in World War II and the World on terror, which is particularly prophetic, as in it, she not only defends Japanese internment, but also suggests that the US government do the same to Arab and Muslim Americans today. This book was released in 2004, and of course, Culture of Corruption, Obama and his team of tax cheats, crooks and cronies. On her blog, she posted the contact details of anti-war protesters in the University of California, Santa Cruz, leading to multiple anti-Semitic attacks and death threats, and lambasted them in a post entitled, Seditious Santa Cruz vs. America. When someone docked her in return, she then felt that she had the right to play the victim over how much trouble this caused her, apparently being totally ignorant of the concept of irony. So she seems delightful. Or so you would think if you only read the headlines or watch TV news. Or if you're even vaguely aware of US domestic and immigration policy. Just one problem. It's not true. 
the United States still maintains the most generous immigration policies in the world. Generous to a fault. Um, what, what the fuck? That's just utter shite. Like, I guess you can make the argument if you don't take into account the size and population of the US and just look at the raw numbers. But the fact is that as a proportion of both the size of the country and the population, the US is far from the best. As the Cato Institute put it, the United Nations data contains information on the foreign-born populations in all countries or semi-independent provinces around the world. US immigration is decidedly unimpressive compared to all countries, although America does have the highest total of foreign-born residents in the world, a fair comparison requires controlling for the size of its current population. After all, a million new people entering India, with a population of 1.5 3 billion would have very different effects than a million new people entering Estonia with a population of 1.3 million. With this in mind, it is clear that America is nowhere near the most generous country in the world on immigration. Of the 232 jurisdictions that the UN includes, America ranks just 64th overall. Focusing on the rate of new immigrants as a share of total population, the United States had only the 49th highest net immigration rate from 2015 to 2017, inflows minus outflows of foreign residents divided by total population. This places the United States rank in the 72nd and 79th percentiles in the world, respectively. This assessment is still misleading, however, because it compares the United States to countries that very few immigrants would want to immigrate. Too. The United States ranking among more prosperous countries is even less inspiring. Of the 50 countries or provinces which had, according to the United Nations, a gross domestic product of at least $20,000 per capita in 2015, the United States has the 34th highest share of foreign-born residents as well as the 34th highest net immigration rate. This places the United States rank in the 32nd percentile on both measures. 50 most prosperous countries have double both the average foreign-born share and average immigration rate of the United States. Those countries at or above the 50th percentile have an average foreign-born share three times the US share and an immigration rate four times as high as the US rate. The United States is far from generous, it is downright stingy to immigrants. Figure 1 provides a net immigration rate from 2015 to 2017 for the United States and the 33 countries that rank higher than it. Because the overwhelming numbers have stymied our ability to assimilate the huddled masses. 50 million residents of America are foreign-born. In fact, today the United States has more immigrants as a percentage of its total population than at any time since 1890. Assimilation must mean something completely different to PragerU, because this happened with the Irish in the early 20th century, the Jewish refugees in the 40s, and so on. Assimilation happens over time. Also, maybe the process of assimilation is slowed down and made more difficult by people like Dennis Prager victimising and othering the groups they want to assimilate. Maybe putting kids who look like their kids in cages and treating their fellow compatriots like subhumans might affect their willingness to assimilate into American culture. That's why, to give one illustration, 176 different languages are spoken among students in the New York City school system. Um, those are second languages. She is now advocating for people to only be able to speak one language. She's complaining about students being able to speak English and a second language. That's one more language than the majority of Americans, incidentally, but this is somehow a bad thing because foreigners equals bad, and apparently being multilingual is un-American. Where you've now got schools where a majority don't speak English, doesn't that say no, to us? No, you've got, a, you've got doesn't schools. Doesn't that say to us? Doesn't that say to us that what we want is a sensible, balanced immigration policy where we want people with skills to come into Britain, but we also want integration in society. Of course we do, and the and schools you refer happening. to, the pupils you refer to, yeah. are registered and recorded as, ha as having English as a second language. They're not yeah. registered and recorded as not being able to speak English. It's That's precisely that sort and of... And some of both. It, well, yes, but <coughs> no one's counted them, so your own children would fit into that category. Uh, well, hopefully, lots of people can speak different languages, but the point I'm making is, do we want to live in an integrated no, society? No, no, forgive me. The point you're making is that schools in the East End are full of children who can't speak English. I just want you to recognise that's not true, what you just said. Come from the home. children who are typified as speaking English as a second language would include your own daughters. They come. Their mother tongue come being German. Homes. They come from homes where English is most definitely not the first language, and in too many cases is not the language at all. Now look, you know, but no one's not. counted how many people they are in the second no, category. No, and it would be a very helpful and useful thing if they did, and perhaps we'd be well, even more surprised and even more shocked. But the or, argument, or, or, here, or perhaps we'd realise that most bilingual well, children in this country are children like yours. How did we get here? For starters. America grants permanent residence to a million people every single year. Permanent residence is not citizenship. 
and also this is nothing but a benefit to the US government to receive taxes from the immigrants but don't have any obligation to keep them if they don't want them. For example, if you break the law, fail to notify the government of a change of address, even if you find yourself homeless, or any number of other petty infractions, then, well, you can be deported. Likewise, if a permanent resident leaves the country for any reason, when they return they'll be subject to the extremely stringent rules around the grounds of inadmissibility. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, because of something you've probably heard referred to as chain migration. Chain migration allows immigrants to sponsor not only their immediate family, parents, spouses, and children under age 21, but much of their extended family once they gain citizenship, unmarried adult children, and any children they might have, married adult children, and their children, and brothers and sisters, and their children. Princeton University researchers, using the most recently available data, found that immigrants sponsored an average of 3.45 additional relatives each. So the 1 million immigrants granted permanent residence each year potentially adds, over time, another 3.5 million. Yeah, that's not how maths works. Those 1 million people include those coming in via chain migration. Also, what's the alternative here? Splitting families up? Dragging kids away from their parents? Keeping them all in separate cages? Oh, no. Wait. So much for the principles of family values that the right loves to complain about. In addition, an estimated 100,000 refugees and asylum seekers, people who claim to be fleeing political or personal strife abroad, enter the country annually. From 2008 to 2017, the U.S. gave green cards to well over a million people for humanitarian reasons, allowing them to live and work here permanently. No, it allows them to live and work here permanently unless they break the law or give the government any reason to deport them. After five years, they can apply for full citizenship. Yes, they can apply. They could be rejected, though. That's what apply means. I can apply for U.S. citizenship doesn't mean I'll get it. We're not done yet. In that same time frame, nearly half a million more people came to America through the Diversity Visa Lottery, a program designed to admit more people from underrepresented countries into the U.S. Diversity Visa applicants don't need a high school education, job skills, or pretty much anything. This is an outright lie. From the instructions provided by the US government to applicants to the visa lottery, requirement number one. Individuals born in countries whose natives qualify may be eligible to enter. If you are not born in an eligible country, there are two other ways you might be able to qualify. Was your spouse born in a country whose natives are eligible? If yes, you can claim your spouse's country of birth, provided that both you and your spouse are named on the selected entry, are found eligible, and issued diversity visas, and enter the United States simultaneously. Were you born in a country whose natives are ineligible, but in which neither of your your parents was born or legally resident at the time of your birth? If yes, you may claim the country of birth of one of your parents if it is a country whose natives are eligible for the DV 2019 program. For more details on what this means, see the frequently asked questions. Requirement 2. Each DV applicant must meet the education or work experience requirement of the DV program by having either at least a high school education or its equivalent, defined a successful completion of a 12-year course of formal elementary and secondary education, or two years of work experience within the past five years in an occupation that requires at least two years of training or experience to perform. This non-stop flow of new legal immigrants, based on family ties instead of skills, abilities, and allegiance to American values, Okay, so this is shite. A society needs low-skilled workers and would be fucked if only highly skilled migrants apply. Also, once again, we get this same values argument. What is an American value? Fascism? Has of course been supplemented by millions who enter the country illegally and stay illegally. Why is this a bad thing? Dominant media outlets use the euphemism undocumented, but the official US government term, used in federal statutes, is illegal alien, an unlawful entrant who came without permission and stays in open defiance of our laws. Okay, why does it matter what we call them? Undocumented immigrant means immigrant with no valid documents and is clearly shorthand. Also, it's disconnected from the legality of the situation, which can change at any time, as the government can rescind the validity of certain documents as it pleases. Also, illegal alien is a great way to dehumanise and vilify these migrants, since undocumented immigrant may cause empathy in people. As, well, they might be just like you and I, if not for an accident of fate. Illegal aliens, though? Ha! <laughs> Subhumans. The number of illegal aliens in the country is usually given as 11 million. But have you noticed that number never seems to change? Common sense suggests it's higher. Much higher. You got a source for that. Common sense is a worthless argument that means nothing, so I hope you have something better up your sleeve. Facts don't care about your feelings, right? 
And though illegal aliens themselves don't qualify for welfare, they receive free health care in our clinics and hospitals. This is, again, untrue. Illegal immigrants are not able to get health insurance and most of the time rely on underfunded local health clinics, which are also available to native citizens. This argument might hold some more weight in a country where there is free universal health care, though I would still argue that everyone should be able to have access to health care, regardless of immigration status. But in the US, where you need insurance to get health care, this is categorically untrue. And through their American-born children, they can expect to receive all manner of benefits, cash aid, food stamps, and housing vouchers. Their children are entitled to a free education in public schools. Okay, but those children are Americans, and refusing to provide these things is just punishing a child for the crimes of its parents. Though again, I would argue that illegal immigration should not be a crime, and we should all just open up our borders. Once again, we get the we care about the children until they're born side of conservatives here. Building a high-tech border barrier would certainly help stem this flow. Would it though? I feel like all it would do is waste all that precious taxpayer money that was so important to hold on to a minute ago when it might have gone towards non-white children. Ending chain migration is another obvious remedy. E-Verify, the national database that allows employers to check workers' immigration status, is also essential. So is a fully functioning entry-exit system to track visa overstayers. This all sounds like it would cost an insane amount of money to implement. We came to a similar dichotomy in the UK recently, where it was reported that clamping down on benefit cheats would be a popular move, but would cost significantly more than just letting it happen, and also would put a lot of very seriously vulnerable people in danger of being accused of faking their illnesses. And here we are a few years later, thousands of disabled people have died after falsely being declared fit for work, and the treasury is down a significant amount of cash, just so people are scamming negligible amounts of money out of the government can be forced back to work. We still haven't had any reason for why illegal immigration is bad, by the way. But all solutions will ultimately fail unless we get control of the numbers and enforce our laws consistently. And apparently this means rounding people up in concentration camps and torturing them? Not sure that's as great a system as you suggest. It's Sovereignty 101. This is our home, and we have not only the right, but the responsibility to determine who comes in, how many come in, and what qualities and qualifications they bring. The truth is, we let in millions, and of course, millions more want to come. Who can blame them? But it's simply not possible or desirable to let in everyone. Why not? Please give a reason. You can't just keep saying immigration bad without an explanation. And it's not hateful to say so. It's not hateful to protect our borders. It's not hateful to protect our citizens. It's not hateful to protect our values. Values including keeping children in disgusting conditions, separating families, refusing to let anyone wash for several weeks, forcing women to drink out of toilets, and once again, running torture camps. Lady Liberty may be shedding tears, not because we've stopped welcoming immigrants, but because our ill-conceived immigration policies are threatening the American dream. I'm Michelle Malkin, CRTV host and author of Invasion and Sold Out for Prager University. This is the kind of speech that we played in history classes with ominous music behind it over footage of atrocities. In fact, let's do just that. The truth is, we let in millions, and of course, millions more want to come. But it's simply not possible or desirable to let in everyone. And it's not hateful to say so. It's not hateful to protect our borders. It's not hateful to protect our citizens. It's not hateful to protect our values. Lady Liberty may be shedding tears, not because we've stopped welcoming immigrants, but because our ill-conceived immigration policies are threatening the American dream. Hello, uh, this is the end of part one. Um, there will be a part two coming soon. I'll probably have a little video in between them. Um, but um, yeah, so look forward to that soon. Give me your tired, give me your tired, give me your core. When our government acts like this, I wonder what World War II was for. And the rest of the country hates us more and more. Lady Liberty is not a whore.